Dr. Anil Rama, who actually connected us, hinted ah, yeah. hinted right. at something like what you're suggesting here, where he said, I asked him, how would you go about choosing a jaw surgeon or choosing a surgical plan for yourself? And he basically said, never compromise aesthetic harmony when having a plan made for yourself because you just don't know whether the bigger advancement is going to give you what you're looking for in terms of a functional mm -hmm. result. And his big thing is this residual scarring of the brain and of the neurology that occurs yeah. with decades of sleep disordered breathing. And there's just no way of knowing whether fixing the box, and even if you can improve the breathing going forward, whether the symptoms are going to reverse given the scarring that's occurred. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's great. Uh, yeah. I just, I love Dr. Rama. Um, just very smart. Well, well, you know, everything he does is well thought out. So yeah. um, there, there are basically, basically three categories I throw sleep patients into. One is an architecture problem or a hard tissue problem. Next is soft tissues and next is neuro, neurological tissues, right? So hard, that's what we're talking about, fixing the architecture, moving the bones, whether it be MARPI expansion, jaw surgery, et cetera, make, make a bigger box, like you said, right? Second is soft tissue, and we mentioned a few of those things, obesity, connective tissue disorders, but there's also myofunctional therapy. So where the muscles aren't working the way they're supposed to because of anatomical differences and or habits, those can be figured out. I, I still remember towards the end of the life of Christian Guillemino, who's like the father of sleep medicine in the United, well, in the world for that matter. But I still remember him coming and saying, yes, um, you know, jaw surgery is great, but uh, if you don't fix the muscles, nothing works, you know? So it's, it's like he was sold on myofunctional therapy too. So that's another soft tissue component, right? <clears throat> then you have tonsils and adenoids, another soft tissue component. Uh, so then neurological, what do we have? Well, we have the central apneas, right? We have the brain generated apneas. That's a problem, but we also have peripheral nerve damage. And Christian was also worried about that. He was like, how soon can we treat these kids? Right? Like if we let them suffer with sleep apnea for a time, he was convinced that there was peripheral nerve damage, that the chemoreceptors and the mechanoreceptors that are responsible for blood pressure and, and heart rate rate response during these episodes of sympathetic stimulation and not breathing, that that, that um, was destroying kids and that you could advance the jaw, you know, 30 millimeters and it still wouldn't solve the neurological damage that already occurred. So that's what Ram is talking about and that's what Christian talked about. And that's the third category. It's the neurological stuff, which is really hard to identify. Yeah. You know, that's kind of kind of depressing actually if you think about it that there's this irreversible damage that might be occurring and that sometimes stuff goes offline and especially with nerves it's hard to get them back online later yep. dr rama talks about maybe um hyperbaric oxygen and other sort of brain hacking technologies that might have some positive impact but mm. yeah a lot of this stuff is kind of a one-way path and uh that's not, it's not a very uplifting message, but there is something to be said though for not allowing it to get worse. Yeah, and I think we're trying, you know what I mean? I, it's, it's sad, but it's like anything in medicine, you know, infections were sad too back in the day and people died from, you know, a tooth infection. And yeah. now we can take teeth out and give antibiotics and it's like, who cares? Yeah. You know, no big deal. I think also- so the day will come, the day will come, we'll figure it out. I think- Part of the issue is, too, is that we're beholden to the only diagnostic, one of the only diagnostic methods that we have to identify sleep disorders is the polysomnograph. So it's great, but honestly, is it everything? Well, in most studies, when we're studying about airway disorders, we're talking about airway collapse, which is, you know, the, the critical pressure of, of the airway closing or PCRID as they talk about it in the studies. And this collapsibility of the airway is like everything, but uh, PSG doesn't measure collapsibility at all. And, and yet that's the foundational architectural functional problem is collapsibility. 
You're saying uh, it can so, only measure the potential indirect consequence of collapsibility, which is the apnea yeah. or the hypopnea, but yeah. it's not measuring the actual mechanical that's occurring. Yeah, exactly. And and that's great. It's the best that we have. It's, you know, gold standard now. Um, but it's really not that I great think, though, is it? Because don't we get a well, lot of false, a lot of false negatives from tests that don't measure for RERAs and other disturbances? Don't a lot of yeah, people get led astray by sleep tests? I mean, a lot. Again, we're on the curve again, right? Yeah. So most people get identified under the curve. That's why we still use it. Yeah. 